we're going to talk about resting state functional connectivity in the mouse. So we're going to zoom out uh, with respect to the last couple talks we've seen. Uh, but first, thank you, uh, David, and the other organizers for inviting me. This is an awesome opportunity um, as a junior faculty member. Uh, so it's an honor to be speaking to you guys today. And so uh, traditionally, methods for mapping out brain function were traditionally performed uh, using task-based approaches. So for example, um, in this case, a subject was asked to open and close their eyes at fixed intervals. And then changes associated with the task were measured, in this case using the bold signal through an fMRI bore, associated with that task. So then if you subtract all of the closed frames from the open frames, you can generate a map of where this activity occurred. So it allowed researchers to relate brain topography to function. But if you look at this purple line, it looks to be very noisy. And so about 20 years ago or so, this noise was found out to be intrinsic neural activity. So this isn't actually noise. This is related to the neural signaling within the brain or spontaneous activity. And it turns out that regions that are functionally related exhibit coherent activity in the spontaneous activity. And so if you just examine the correlation coefficients over the brain, you can map out resting state networks. Kind of the beauty of the technique is that these maps look very much like the task-based uh, approaches. However, you can map out the full functional connectome in the brain in 10 to 15 minutes. And so it opens up a large variety of patient populations that are incapable of performing tasks, such as infants and people in, under stroke. And so what our lab's been doing over the last several years is developing fMRI-like techniques but using optical methods uh, for applications in the mouse. So it turns out that pattern disruption of these resting state networks is often a hallmark of some kind of disease of the CNS. And so what we've been developing over the last several years is an, a functional connectivity optical intrinsic signal imaging method. It's a rather simple system compared to the other things you've seen today. Uh, there's just a few LEDs that illuminate the intact skull. Uh, the scalp is removed, but the skull is left completely intact. And then changes in diffuse reflected light are detected by the camera. And then we take advantage of the absorption coefficients of hemoglobin to unmix their contribution to our absorption signal. So when all said and done, if you take a mouse and you anesthetize it with ketamine and you put it in our system, this is what you're going to measure. So this is the dorsal view of the cortex. You're, you're looking at the spontaneous activity that's occurring in the brain. Uh, these are very slow frequencies, so less than a tenth of a hertz. And so this is sped up about 20 times. So typically, we analyze these movies using seed-based approaches. So if you have these three regions, you'll have these three time courses over the five-minute movie that we're looking at. And you can see kind of immediately that the blue and the green trace are very temporally coherent. And they're doing something different than the red trace. So if you take this green trace and you correlate with all of the other time courses within the brain, you'll generate a functional connectivity map for that green seed. And you can do this for all of the regions within your field of view to generate a set of topographical maps of the functional organization of the mouse brain. And kind of the first application that we had was in collaboration with Dave Holtzman Group, looking at a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. And so you see that these young mice exhibit very normal, bilaterally symmetric functional connectivity patterns. But this age group, uh, at 12 months, starts to exhibit some appreciable functional disruption. And so one way to compress these data into a single number is to look at homotopic connectivity, or connectivity between left-right seed pairs. So we do that here, and we find that in this particular region, there's appreciable decline in frontal cortex. And if we look at the other brain regions that we were looking at in this particular study, every region is disrupted, some more than others. So you might assume that this has something to do with plaque pathology. So we quantified the plaque pathology. You can see that there's a heterogeneous distribution of plaques. Regions like retrosplenial and motor have a lot of plaques. Other regions like visual do not. And so one interesting thing we found was that regions that harbor lots of A-beta tended to decline uh, the most, like retrosplenial. And regions that harbored the uh, least amount of A-beta uh, declined the least. But what was kind of counterintuitive, or what wasn't as intuitive as that finding, is that connectivity in the young group was predictive of A-beta plaque load in the older group. So mice that exhibit rather uh, little functional connectivity magnitude between homotopic regions like somatosensory didn't end up uh, being that vulnerable to plaque deposition. Whereas retrosplenial cortex, which is exhibiting a very high functional connectivity magnitude, harbored the most plaques. So this was a really interesting result in this particular study. So there's been a number of follow-up uh, studies that we've done with Dave Holtzman's group. Uh, I want to show one in particular because it not only shows that FCOS is sensitive to functional disruption, but also functional restoration. And so this study was led by uh, Fan Liao, and these mice were given an anti-APOE antibody treatment. And in this particular study, we found behavioral rescue, uh, fewer plaques were developed with this antibody treatment, but we also see functional restoration in certain networks, so primarily between visual 
and somatosensory compared to PBS controls. So AD is a very diffuse disease. Uh, we also looked at mouse models of stroke, which is a very focal disease. Uh, mice were given varying degrees of uh, transient middle cerebral artery occlusion. Uh, so and then they were segmented into three groups, small, medium, and large strokes. And if you look at motor cortex, as the, the infarcts get bigger, the, uh, the disruption also increases, which might be kind of expected. And that ends up correlating pretty well with infarct volume. But if you look at somatosensory cortex, even in this group one with only subcortical strokes, you see appreciable decline. And then it kind of stays down. So it actually didn't correlate with infarct volume. Uh, these mice were asked or, or tested to remove stickers from their forepaws. So mice with the largest strokes took the longest time to remove. And we found that motor connectivity was predictive of removal time. So it was a very sensitive region to look at in terms of trying to estimate behavioral performance, unlike somatosensory cortex. So I kind of want to switch gears a little bit and talk about what we've been doing more recently, uh, which is increasing the specificity of hemodynamic imaging. And so as we saw, these tasks evoked in resting state maps reflect coherent activity across many different types of cells, which makes it difficult to discern excitatory versus inhibitory processes within a network. <clears throat> so optogenetic approaches are very natural for probing local and, brain, and global brain circuitry. And so uh, you can buy these mice off the shelf. These mice express channel rhodopsin uh, in excitatory neurons primarily expressed in layer five. Uh, and kind of the, the beauty of the simplicity of the system is that it's amenable to incorporating other modalities or other methods into it. And so you can, you can easily integrate galvos and mirrors and lenses and other things to scan laser beams, in this case, over the head of the mice. And so we're going to evaluate the cell-specific connectivity, unlike the resting state data. And so effective connectivity, I'm explicitly referring to the influence of this locally driven excitatory activity over the rest of our field of view. And so if you stimulate where this blue dot is, you see very local activity, but you also see activity on the other side of the brain. And if I take this evoked time course of the blue seed over this 25 second window and correlate it with the other time courses, I can generate a cell specific functional connectivity map uh, based on the thigh one cell population. And so it took us a lot of work to figure out the proper dosages of the stimulus, but you can generate maps like this and maps like these with single stimulus presentations in single mice that are awake and behaving under our system. And so you can see a, a very rich connectivity structure here, right? So motor and parts of somatosensory exhibit these very distinct islands of, of activity. And some are bilaterally distributed, some are unilaterally distributed. But what's really cool is if you compare them to the resting state maps. So the resting state maps don't tend to show any of this rich connectivity structure, right? So these distinct islands are either non-existent or obscured in the resting state data. And in general, if you look at the resting state maps, they're all very bilaterally symmetric and don't have the richness of this connectivity structure. <clears throat> and so resting state functional connectivity tends to involve polysynaptic communication. And it can be mediated by subcortical structures like the thalamus, which can excite certain brain regions at the same time to make them excitable at the same time. And so we hypothesize that these thigh one base maps might be more closely related to axonal projection connectivity than the resting state data. And so just using off-the-shelf tools from the Allen Institute, you can look and see, for example, where motor cortex is connected. So if you inject motor cortex with a tracer, you can see it's, it's ipsilateral, contralateral, subcortical connections. But one really cool thing that these guys have uh, enabled everybody to do is look at just cortical connectivity. And they've conveniently placed it on a dorsal field of view, just like our system. And so we compared our thigh one base maps and our resting state maps to the Allen Institute data. And what we find that in general, or in, in this particular example, that the thigh one data overlap very well with the uh, external projection data, whereas the resting state data don't overlap barely at all in this particular example. And it, it turns out that all of the examples that we looked at, in general, thigh one effective connectivity appears to be more biased towards uh, uh, reporting monosynaptic connections. And so there's a number of follow-up studies that we're doing using some of these techniques. Uh, we're exploring the influence of cortical remodeling after stroke by uh, examining activity-dependent plasticity. And so our lab gave a talk earlier today on the role of excitatory neurons on paralesional remapping. And in fact, in this study, we found that if you excite the contralesional side of the brain, that that's actually detrimental to functional recovery. We also have some studies evaluating neurodegeneration by looking at regional glucose metabolism, as well as modifying where plaques tend to be more vulnerable. So I'd like to thank all of the co-authors and collaborators I've had doing this.
Uh, a lot of this work was done while I was a, a postdoc and instructor in Joe Culver's lab. So I want to thank him for being an awesome mentor and colleague over the years, and then everybody else that I've worked with. So thank you.